Uh, okay, that's one. Brief introduction. I don't have to introduce you to Professor Nathan Sam. I, mean, I just want to say it's, uh, we are very honored and delighted to have uh, all these distinguished visitors here today. Not only Professor Sam, but uh, Teresa Robertson from uh, uh, University of California, Santa Barbara, and, um, and Professor Jonathan Berg. I'm, I know I'm pronouncing it wrongly. Jonathan Berg. Right? Uh, <laughs> Professor Berg is from uh, uh, New York originally, then he got his PhD at UCLA uh, with uh, Tyler Birch, uh, and now he's currently uh, currently professor at the University of Haifa in Israel. Teresa uh, graduated in Princeton with uh, Scott Soames, right? And is, uh, was previously at the University of Kansas and is currently at UC Santa Barbara, same as Nathan. Nathan is, uh, oh, I'm sure everyone here read uh, uh, stuff. You had to because you're my student. You had to read Nathan Samuels. Uh, at least uh, we had a, a very in interesting seminar on the Fregas puzzle here uh, about a year ago. Yeah. So here's the guy. You may ask him directly questions now. <laughs> Thanks a lot to you for coming. And of course, Breno Hacks. Breno is actually the one that is responsible for bringing all these uh, celebrities here because they were all invited for security. Well, Right? And now on the way, they were way back home, they uh, agreed to stop here and give us a chance as well to listen to them. But Breno is responsible for bringing all these people here. Blame Breno. him. <laughs> <laughs> uh, by the way, Breno is, is, is uh, doing an incredible job in bringing uh, interesting people to Brazil and having uh, nice uh, events. And so he's going to make a short uh, comment on, uh, not on this paper by Nathan Sam, but on another pa unpublished paper but in a summer, right after he stopped, right? Uh, uh, it's going to be a short thing. Uh, Nathan's going to talk now in the afternoon, then, then Breno is going to give a short talk, and in the afternoon we're going to have Teresa and uh, Jonathan, right? And after that, you know what we are going to do, right? Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Marco. Uh, uh, let's see. Um, I want to thank all of the people here who have already heard this talk. For your patience <laughs> and listening to it. Uh, a second time, or maybe a third time, <laughs> yeah, maybe a third or fourth time in some cases. So I'm going to address the. Uh, oh, you all have, have a copy of the handout. Yes. No. Somebody in the back. In the back. Need to lobby. No, no. This one. I'm going to address the following issue. What exactly is expressed in a sentence of the form of zero, which says alpha exists, and you're to imagine that alpha is a genuine singular term? There are several competing answers to this question. I'm going to defend one, or at least one kind of answer, an answer of a certain kind. I will compare four different accounts of individual existence attributions. I think I actually said this last time, and I only compared three. Uh, but Three or four. I could do three or four now. Um, three of these take, or two or three of these, take their cue from the famous Kantian dictum that existence is not a predicate. The fourth is a result of denying this dictum, that is, it's the claim that existence is a predicate. Uh, Kant's thesis lies at the heart of his diagnosis of what goes wrong with the ontological argument of the existence of God, and the ontological proof of the existence of God, which is due to you on the handout. Two premises and a conclusion. Premise one, God is the possible individual who is actually divine. Premise two, any possible individual that is actually divine actually exists. Therefore, conclusion C, God actually exists. Um, the adjective here, divine, uh, is to stand for whatever is the arguer's favorite notion of divinity could be perfection in every respect of Descartes for uh, that, than which nothing greater is conceivable, as with Anselm. Uh, the argument is evidently a valid argument. Each of the premises is also alleged to be an analytic truth, making the conclusion allegedly analytic as well. And Kant's complaint focuses attention on the alleged analyticity of the second premise, <coughs> P2. Um, he notes that only genuine properties, what he calls real predicates, may serve as defining criteria for the concept. Insofar as divinity analytically entails the non-property of existence, Kant insists, divinity cannot legitimately, 
legitimately be included as a defining condition for the concept of God, nor for any other concept. Now, strictly, one should distinguish at least two different related Kantian theses, which one might put by saying that existence is not a predicate. One of these theses is metaphysical in nature, and the other one is logical. The metaphysical thesis is that existence is not a property of individual things. As a Kantian might prefer to phrase it, there is no such property as a putative property of individual existence. The logical thesis is that the English verb exist is not of the logical type, extensional first order monadic predicate. That is, it's not a predicate logically applicable to individual things. Typically, the Kantian claims that properly understood, the word exist is instead an English term for the logician's unrestricted existential quantifier, the backwards E. Now, the answer that I favor to the question of what's expressed by sentence zero is precisely the opposite of both of these uh, theses that are extracted from the Kantian dictum. I claim that existence is straightforwardly and obviously a property of individuals, nothing more and nothing less. And as Guido commented, it's one of our most important properties. Moreover, the English verb exists as a term for this property, and as such, it's an ordinary extension of first order monadic predicate. Like, is a student, is a philosopher, is a predicate, just like that. Consequently, zero simply ascribes the particular property of existence to the individual designated by the term alpha. Furthermore, with regard to those instances of zero that are false, and there are many, this is due to the not particularly remarkable fact that whereas the term alpha does designate, the thing that it designates has non-existence, which is the complement of the property that's ascribed in sentence zero. So in other words, zero is false exactly where the designatum of alpha is something that doesn't exist. Now in saying that sentence zero can be falsified and is falsified in cases where alpha designates something that does not exist, I'm evidently using some form of existential quantification. I say that alpha designates something or other that doesn't exist. The existential quantifier in question is not restricted to individuals that do exist. It includes non-existent individuals. Some instances will be specified in just a moment. Indeed, instances that, in, that even Kantians fully recognize, although Kantians will claim that these instances are uh, existent since they are things. Now Kantians will be appalled by what I'm saying here. Necessarily, if a thing has non-existence, then it does not exist. And if so, then there's nothing there to have the putative property of uh, existence or any other property. Therefore, it's impossible for anything to have the putative property of non-existence. It's impossible for anything to have the putative property of non-existence. Bertrand Russell explicitly embraced both of the Kantian theses, both the metaphysical and the logical theses. He held furthermore that insofar as alpha is a genuine singular term and not a disguised quantificational location, that sentence zero is neither true nor false, but altogether meaningless. And I have some quotes here from Russell. He says, the actual things that there are in the world do not exist, or at least that is putting it too strongly because that is utter nonsense. I don't know why he says, or at least, he should, he, said, he should say, or even worse, that is putting it too strongly because it's utter nonsense. To say that they do not exist is strictly nonsense, but to say that they do exist is also strictly nonsense. There is not an idea that will apply to individuals in existence. As regards the actual things that there are in the world, there is nothing at all you can say about them that corresponds to this notion of existence. It's a sheer mistake to say that there is anything analogous to existence that you can say about them. You get into confusion through language because it's perfectly correct to say, uh, it's a perfectly correct thing to say, all the things in the world exist, um, and it's so easy to pass from this to this exists because it is a thing in the world. There is no sort of point in a predicate that could not conceivably be false. I mean, it's perfectly clear to, that if there were such a thing as this existence of individuals, that we talk of, it would be absolutely impossible for it not to apply. And this is the characteristic of a mistake. <clears throat> Continuing the quote, there is a vast amount of philosophy that rests upon the notion that existence is, so to speak, a property that you can attribute to things, and that the things that exist have the property of existence, and the things that do not 
exist do not. That is rubbish. To say of someone that he existed would be uttering nonsense. Not a falsehood, but nonsense. It is not false, but it has no meaning at all. And he goes even further. This is, I think everything I've just read is from his, uh, is from his uh, philosophy of logical atomism lectures. But in his book, My Philosophical Development, he says something even stronger. He says, the sentence, Scott exists, is bad grammar. It can at best be interpreted as meaning that the person named Scott exists, but the phrase the person named Scott is a definite description, not a name. Whenever a name is properly used as a name, it's bad grammar to say that exists. So as far as Russell is concerned, sentence zero is ungrammatical. It doesn't have any meaning. In response to all considerations that have been brought forth in favor of the logical theses extracted from the Kantian dictum, I'm deeply sympathetic with what I call the quack quack reply. That's the English version of the sound that a duck makes, quack. <laughs> According to the old adage, if it looks like a duck and it walks like a duck and it quacks like a duck, it is a duck. The verb exist satisfies every reasonable syntactic and pragmatic criterion for being an extensional first order monadic predicate of English. For example, appending the word exist to a singular term, to a singular term, yields a grammatical English sentence, just as with any first order monadic predicate. Furthermore, it can fill the blanks in schema LL on the end up. If X equals Y, then X blank, if and only if Y blank. You can put the word exists in there, just like with any predicate, any extensional first order predicate. And so on with respect to any other plausible test for first order pneumatic predicates. If our quantifiers are both actualist and presentist, that is, if our quantifiers range over all and only actually presently existing individuals, the English verb exist is fully definable by means of a formal expression that unquestionably belongs to the category of extensional first order pneumatic predicate. And that's the expression given to you on the handout that I'm calling DF. Uh, it is this, lambda x, there is a y, x equals y. That, in case you're not familiar with lambda, this can be read as follows. Is an object x such that there is an object y such that x and y are the same thing? So if there is here means there exists, then we can define existence in terms of it, not surprisingly, uh, as is an object x such that there exists an object y such that x and y are the same thing? Contrary to Russell, the verb exist is even false of particular things. So I promised I'd give you some examples. For example, it's false of Russell himself. The verb exist was true of Russell, of course, but it ceased to be so the moment that great philosopher drew his last breath. Although the verb exist is presently true of the present speaker, myself, and currently true of my audience, each one of you, all of us will suffer the same fate as Russell, eventually becoming a thing of which the verb is then false. Each one of us will someday not exist. <clears throat> I know you already knew that. So, it's a sobering thought. <laughs> a variety of arguments have been offered in support of the metaphysical thesis extracted from the Kantian dictum. dictum. Nearly all of them, I think, are excessively weak and wide open to what I call the quack quack reply. Now, one of the weakest arguments is surely that of Kant himself, which he gave him a critique of pure reason. Uh, there, Kant argued that in, utter in uttering sentence zero, and I'm quoting, we attach no new predicate to the concept expressed by alpha, but only posit the subject in itself with all its predicates. Close quote. And why is this so? Whatever he means by it. Because, according to Kant, and again I'm quoting, Nothing can have been added to the concept which expresses merely what is possible. By my thinking its object through the, through the expression, it is, as given absolutely. In other words, the real contains no more than the merely possible. A hundred real tollers does not contain the least coin more than a hundred possible tollers. I guess toller was a you know, currency. Uh, presumably the word dollar. Uh, Kant's position appears to be that since existence is not a property and therefore not an aspect in which one thing might differ from another, there is therefore no difference between a hundred real dollars 
and 100 merely possible dollars. That's his, point. That's his argument. There's no difference at all between 100 dollars and 100 merely possible. Ironically, or 100, sorry, no difference at all between 100 real dollars and 100 merely possible dollars. Now, ironically, Kant goes on to state the obvious reply. I don't give him credit for that. Uh, as he puts it, and I'm quoting him now, my financial position is, however, affected very differently by 100 real dollars, dollars, than it is by their mere possibility. So he's sort of on to what's wrong with his argument. <laughs> it's completely wrong. <laughs> Nevertheless, in a giant leap backward, Kant insists, uh, and he goes on to say the following, to conceive 100 dollars are not themselves in the least increased through acquiring existence outside my concept. So he's just backpedaling. He just discovered and announced what's wrong with his argument, and then he just denies, denies it. A Con Kant's response is characteristically um, murky. In fact, one of the few things that's clear concerning his position is that it's incorrect. Uh, in the first place, insofar as existence genuinely adds no real property to the possibility or concept of God, for example, that is, insofar as merely possible God, merely possible God is no more worthy of worship than a real God, there cannot be any harm in defining the word God by invoking the concept of divinity. So what if divinity is not a property of individuals? But let us set this consideration aside. It's simply and flatly wrong that a real dollar is not worth one cent more than a merely possible dollar. And it's also wrong that a real real is not worth one centavo more than a merely possible real. If one merely possible dollar is subtracted from one real dollar, the remaining amount is exactly one dollar. It just struck me that the unit of currency is called real, I mean, real. <laughs> <laughs> Somehow that's probably important. That real. We could have the possible. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that country would <I'm> bankrupt. <laughs> the possible. Um, OK, so. If one merely possible dollar is subtracted from one real dollar, the remaining amount is exactly one dollar, which is something, not much these days, but something. What is true, and this is the most that can be said on behalf of the metaphysical Kantian thesis, is that a hundred existent dollars does not contain one cent more than a hundred dollars. A hundred existent dollars has greater monetary value than a hundred merely possible dollars, in fact, exactly a hundred dollars worth of monetary value, but 100 existent dollars has no more monetary value than 100 dollars. An existent dollar is simply a dollar, no less and no more. The existence of the dollar per se does not add to its monetary value any more than, for example, its history of previous ownership does. One might conclude from this that existence is not a feature that affects the value of a dollar, but it doesn't follow that existence is no feature at all. In fact, even the weaker conclusion is incorrect. Among the things that affect the real value of the dollar is its existence. To illustrate, and this is a thought experiment, um, I imagine that I have a dollar bill, let's say an American dollar bill, and call it Georgie, and now take a match, light it, and then start burning the, the dollar bill, and just hold on to it until it burns completely. Uh, if the experiment is properly performed, Georgie no longer exists. Now, go out and try to stand Georgie on a candy bar. One will thereby obtain empirical confirmation that Georgie no longer has its monetary value. Now it's not worth one dollar. It's not worth 25 cents. It's not worth even one cent. And the only significant difference or change that has taken place in Georgie that can account for its sudden loss in value is that Georgie has been rendered non-existent. In fact, Georgie is not only no longer existent, it's also no longer a dollar bill. It's a former dollar bill, or as John Cleese would say, an X dollar bill. Why is that? The answer is because Georgie has lost a former feature that was essential both to its former worth and to its being what it formerly was, that is, to its being a dollar bill. And that feature was its existence. Now, Saul Kripke rejects Russell's theory that sentence zero is meaningless, but he's sympathetic to the spirit of the metaphysical Kantian thesis. In the final lecture of his famous unpublished manuscript, Reference and Existence, the John Locke lectures, he says the following, and I, I take it that this will be published someday soon. 
uh, Kripke says the following. There may be some sense in which existence isn't a predicate, in which one can say that the, in which one can say that Napoleon exists, that the sentence Napoleon exists doesn't attribute a property to Napoleon. After all, you're not attributing a property to Napoleon when you say he exists. You are saying there is such a thing for properties to be attributed to. That, in some rather obscure sense, seems to me to be true, and it's perhaps what Kant had in mind. That's the quote from Kripke. Now, I agree with Kripke that this may be what Kant had in mind, but the rather obscure observation seems to me to be simply false. Here again, the apparent argument for the Kantian conclusion invites the quack, quack reply. If X, something X, is something for properties to be attributed to, that is, it's a candidate for having properties, and something Y is also a candidate for having properties, then there's at least this much that X and Y have in common, namely being a candidate for having properties. But what is this thing, being a candidate for having properties, that which X and Y have in common, but a special property of X and of Y? In fact, as I have argued elsewhere, far from being equivalent to existence, the having of properties is not even a sufficient condition for existence. Otherwise put, existence is not a necessary condition for having properties. Ironically, Kripke's very example of Napoleon is as good a counterexample as any. Having died in exile on Elba, Napoleon does not exist. He once existed, of course, and as Russell noted, when he existed, he saw to it that people thought about him. But Napoleon exists no longer. You may, that's a rather obscure, uh, that's an obscure reference to an argument that Russell makes in uh, philosophy, in uh, the introduction to mathematical philosophy. Uh, Russell points out that the difference between Napoleon and, uh, I think it's Hamlet, uh, he says, is that if, if all of the thoughts that Shakespeare had about Hamlet, if he had never had those thoughts, and nobody ever thought about Hamlet, you'd come to the end of him, there, there would be no Hamlet. But if nobody ever thought about Napoleon, he would see to it that somebody did. <laughs> so there's a big difference between Hamlet and Napoleon. And what I'm claiming is, although that's true, Napoleon doesn't exist. He did exist, but he doesn't exist. <clears throat> Even in death, Napoleon has a variety of properties. For example, the property of being mentioned by Kripke in 1973, or the property of being mentioned by me in this very sentence. While he existed, Napoleon saw to it that even after his demise, he would still have the property of being thought about. And I think there are lots of properties that Napoleon has right now, even though he doesn't exist right now. These are just to mention some of them. I subscribe to the existence as predicate theory which Kant and his followers reject, and which Kripke in particular dismisses. If existence is a property, then although necessarily every individual that exists has the property, particular individuals do actually lack it. For example, Napoleon, for example, Russell. Uh, notwithstanding the solemnity with which Kant's pronoun pronouncements are sometimes received, a dollar's existence makes all the difference in the world regarding its monetary value. On the existence as predicate theory, the sentence of the form zero is not semantically distinguished or unusual in any way. It's like any typical monadic predicate sentence of this form. So I'm going to use the black word here. Uh, uh, it's like any sentence of this form. Uh, so imagine that pi is a predicate, and now plus the subject term. Uh, the argument for the predicate. Um, it expresses a proposition composed of the customary content of the subject term alpha, together with the customary <coughs> content of the predicate pi, in this case, the property or concept of existence. Where pi is an extensional first order monadic predicate, the sentence pi alpha is true if and only if alpha customarily designates something that has the property p, which is expressed by pi. And it's false if and only if alpha customarily designates something that has the complementary property non-p. This is exactly why the sentence Kripke exists is true, while the sentence Napoleon exists is false. Kripke has existence, and Napoleon has non-existence. There's nothing abnormal or out of the ordinary here. In exactly the same way, the sentence Kripke lives in New York is true, and the sentence Napoleon lives in New York is false, because Kripke has the property of living in New York, 
while Napoleon has the property of not living anywhere, including New York. This kind of consideration in itself provides strong reason to doubt the Kantian dignity. <coughs> the burden of proof is surely on the side of Kant and his followers, and it's an enormous burden, especially given the intuitive appeal of the quack, quack reply. There is, however, one, at least one, forceful consideration against the existence of predicate theory. So consider sentence one on the handout, the present king of France exists. Sentence one. This appears to have the logical form of a Platonic monadic predication involving a definite description of subject. As such, it appears to be a false instance of sentence zero. However, the falsity of one is not secured in the ordinary manner by virtue of the putative predicate being false of the customary designatum of the subject term. For in this case, the subject term, the phrase the present king of France, has no customary designatum. There is no present king of France to have the property of non-existence. And it's precisely on this basis, which is not the ordinary basis, that sentence one is false. If the subject term occurring in an ordinary monadic predication has no designatum, as occurring in that position. Then according to what I've said, if exists, if the word exists really is an extensional first order monadic predicate, then the sentence as a whole should be neither true nor false. It should lack truth value. Since sentence one has truth value, namely falsity, the description of the present king of France, although it customarily designates nothing, must designate something as occurring in sentence one. Indeed, it must there designate something in which the verb exists as it occurs in sentence one, is false. Otherwise, one should be neither true nor false. In short, the verb exist is a non-extensional operator. So let's follow this line. This is the consideration against my view of the existence of the credit. So let's follow this line of thought. This alternative to Russell's Kantian tax sees Napoleon's existence as a property all right, but not as a property of Napoleon. What then shall the description designate as occurring in one? And what property shall the exist falsely predicate of the designatum? So here's a couple of, I'm going to give a couple of theories that follow this one. And one of them is Frege's own theory. Frege. Frege held that sentence zero asserts something about the term alpha itself, namely that it designates. And I've got a couple of quotes here that I could give if we need to talk about Frege's scholarship, but I'm not a Frege scholar, so I will let Derek comment on that if he wishes. But here's what Frege's theory appears to be. Frege's suggestion appears to be that the sentence Kripke exists attributes the property of designating something to Kripke's name, and nothing to Kripke himself. It just talks about the name Kripke, and says this name designates. In general, sentences of the form zero, a sentence of the form zero on Frege's uh, theory is analyzed by means of zero prime on the handout, right in the middle of the handout. There is an object X such that quote alpha designates in English X. I'm going to call this the semantic ascent theory of existence. This is very different from, and in fact it's opposed to Russell's theory that the sentence zero is meaningless. On the semantic ascent theory, Zero says something fairly ordinary about a term. In some cases, something true. In other cases, something false. The semantic ascent theory of existence is a myth. To its credit, it does succeed in capturing information that is indeed conveyed in uttering sentence zero. But to invoke a distinction that I've emphasized in previous work, this concerns what's pragmatically imparted in zero and not necessarily what is semantically encoded or contained in sentence zero. Semantic ascent, while capturing, a prag while capturing pragmatically important information, does not attain the right semantic content for sentence zero, or even the right modal intention, which is the corresponding function from possible worlds to truth values. Indeed, that the semantic ascent interpretation of zero by means of zero prime is incorrect is easily established by a variety of considerations. The semantic ascent theory is analogous to Frege's own account in his Begriffschrift uh, of identity. In that masterpiece, uh, I'm sorry, in his later masterpiece, Uber Zinn in the Deutung, uh, which I'm sure all of you read, uh, usually translated into English as on sense and reference or on sense and 
denotation, sometimes that's on sense of meaning. Uh, Frege objects to the semantic ascent theory of identity on the grounds that it semantically characterizes the sentence Hesperus is phosphorus, which expresses an astronomical proposition about a particular heavenly body, as instead expressing a particular kind of semantic proposition about natural language, something that's true, at least in part, as a result of linguistic convention or stipulation or decision or usage. That is, is he gave at one time in the Griffith, 1892, in the he believed that Hesperus, the sentence Hesperus is phosphorus simply says that the names Hesperus and Phosphorus are co-designated. And then, sorry, that was 1879, sorry. And then in 1892, in Ubersen and Bedoito, he rejects that. And he complains about it, that it mischaracterizes that sentence, the content of the sentence, which he says is not about names, and it's not made true by linguistic convention or uh, usage. And instead, it's about the planet, Venus and it's true independently, any human activity at all. He's right about that, okay? he's right in rejecting his earlier view. Curiously, even as late as 1906, Frege evidently failed to see that this subjection to the semantic ascent theory of identity applies with equal force against the semantic ascent theory of existence. That theory, that theory also mischaracterizes the fact that Venus exists as yet another result of human activity, and of course, Venus's existence has nothing to do with human <coughs> activity or language or culture. Um, now, Frege's most effective apologist and defender is Alonzo Church. Uh, and Church raised a crushing objection to semantic ascent analyses in general. If, and this is the famous Church translation argument. So translate sentence one into French, and you obtain uh, sentence 1F on the handout, the roi présent de France existe. Uh, if, now translate the proposed analysis into French, and you obtain 1F prime, which is the present king of France désigne quelque chose en anglais. And you'll notice that in 1F prime, you quote an English phrase, and you say in French that it designates something in English. The two translations, while both true, clearly mean different things in French. So too, therefore, do what they translate. Okay. Now, so that the semantic ascent theory of existence doesn't work, I'm going to suggest now another variant. This is going to be a variant on semantic ascent theory. Um, a theory of singular existence statements that's still Fragian in spirit, but vastly superior to the semantic ascent theory, takes the verb exist as it occurs, as it is used in zero, to be what Frege would have called an ungerada, a device. Um, ungerada is translated into English as indirect, sometimes as oblique. Um, so that sentence zero concerns not the term alpha, but its content. It's what Frege would call its sin, its sense. This is analogous to the semantic ascent theory of existence, except that one climbs it further up to the level of intention. On the Ungerata theory of existence, sentence zero is analyzed not by means of zero prime, but by means of zero double prime. This involves some notation that you may not be familiar with. There is an X, and I've got the Greek letter uh, delta, and then I've got some quotation, a weird quotation mark around alpha X. Um, let me explain that notation. Delta is a dyadic predicate for the relation between a Fregian sin and that of which it's a concept in Church's sense. And so delta just means is a concept of or is a sense for. And the caret, the quotation mark, is a what I call an indirect quotation, it's a device for indirect quotation. That is, it's a device for content quotation as opposed to direct quotation in which you mention the very expression. This is a different kind of quotation mark that creates a name for the <coughs> sense of an expression instead of a name for the expression itself. So his theory, this, this, this is not Frege's own theory, but this is the variant and the superior theory, um, analyzes alpha exists as saying that the concept expressed by alpha is a concept of that, of, some, of something. Of something. <clears throat> On this theory, 
to utter the sentence Kripke exists is not to say that the name designates something. Um, it's rather to say that the concept expressed by the name uh, is a concept of something, is a sense for some individual. The Ungarada theory of existence is not refuted by the usual objections to the semantic ascent theories. Unlike the semantic ascent theory of existence, the Ungarada theory even obtains the correct modal intention of the sentence theory. So it's far superior to the semantic ascent theory. <clears throat> As a matter of fact, I think the church himself believes the, this theory that I'm talking about now. Uh, the Ungarada theory of existence. Okay, now I mentioned that we're looking at a uh, objection to the uh, existence as predicate theory, which is how can the sentence like one be false unless the phrase the present king of France designates something as it's occurring in one? Otherwise, you have no truth about it. And I now want to respond to that objection which I think is erroneous. So to illustrate why I think it's erroneous, let me introduce the name Lou, L-O-U, according to the stipulation that it's to name the present king of France, if there presently is a king of France, and it's to designate nothing if there isn't. Now, just to be clear, I, I know that France doesn't have a king right now. Present. It used to have kings, but it doesn't have kings. But here's the, here's, here's the way the word Lou works. Suppose I'm wrong. I mean, it's not a priori that France hasn't been, that just this morning, you know, somebody named Lou took over and he's now king of France, right? So let's suppose that France is a monarchy and it does have a king and that happened just this morning. Then I'm letting the name Lou, I'm introducing the name Lou to name whoever is king of France. But if it turns out that France isn't a monarchy, as I think probably it isn't, um, the name Lou doesn't designate anything. So that's how I introduce the name Lou. Uh, now consider the following analog of sentence one, namely sentence two. Lou exists. As with one, the subject term of two has no customary designata, and it would seem that it's precisely for this reason that two is false. Since two evidently has truth value, namely falsity, the name Lou must designate something as it occurs in two, of which the verb exists as it occurs in two is false, and there's nothing else for the name to designate, but perhaps its sense. Now, according to the anti fragian theory of direct reference, what I've defended at some length, which I've defended at some length in previous writings, there is no Fragian sin for the name Lou to designate. Any non-designating name has no content. If this is correct, the name remains non-designating as it occurs in two, even if the English verb exists, is an Ingrata operator. Now many arguments have been made against the Fragian theory of senses, several of which are very well known, and several of which are due to Kripke. And it it's not to my purpose to rehearse those arguments, but instead to focus attention on a less widely used form of argument, which Kripke has exploited against the semantic ascent theory of identity, and also against a very radical version of direct reference, which is Donovan's theory of the semantically referential use of depth of descriptions. Kripke's argument strategy has considerable force when applied against the Ingerala theory of existence. Ironically, the same argument strategy applies with equal force in defense of the very, the very theory that Kripke rejects and that I embrace the uh, anti-Kantian thesis uh, that existence is a predicate, a property of individual things. How does the Kripke argument strategy provide a defense of existence as predicate? Well, the strategy is this. Uh, if you've got a phenomenon um, and you're trying to explain it by means by saying that a certain natural theory is wrong, so there's this phenomenon and it falsifies the natural view. Uh, imagine a hypothetical language, a possible language. It may not really be any actual natural language. Just imagine a hypothetical language which is spoken by some community in which the natural view is stipulated to be correct. That's the way this language works. It's a possible language to stipulate that the natural view, the natural language, actually is the correct account of this hypothetical language. And ask yourself whether this phenomenon that supposedly refutes the natural theory would still arise even 
if the community spoke this hypothetical language? And if your answer is, yes, yeah, this phenomenon would still arise anyway, even if the theory were true, this was still arise, then that phenomenon cannot really be considered evidence against the theory. It doesn't count against the theory at all. This is the famous Schum identity response that gives to the semantic descent theory of identity. So I'm going to give that formula. So suppose that the Ungerata theory is correct as regards the English verb exist. And let's now expand English into a slightly enriched language, which I'll call Schmenglish, by stipulating an artificial intransitive verb as an artificial term for the property of individual existence. And the verb I'm going to use is Schmexist. Spell it. Stipulation is it's a term for existence, individual existence. The term may be taken as defined as, a, uh, as defined by means of df on the handout, as long as you take the existential quantifier there to be actualist and present. Unlike the natural language verb exist, our new term is by stipulation not an ungarata operator, but an ordinary extensional and first order monadic predicate, a term for the existence of an individual. And consider now the Schmenglish analog of sentence two, which is sentence three. Lou Schme exists. <coughs> All right, so Lou was introduced by stipulation. Schme exists was introduced by stipulation. We've got a fully stipulated content or a, a way of interpreting sentence three. Now, it feels as, as if three is false, precisely because Lou has no customary designatum, and not for the more ordinary reason that what the name Lou does designate has the complementary property of non-existence. But if three has truth value, the name Lou, although it customarily designates nothing, would have to designate something, as it occurs in sentence three, something of which the verb Schm exists, as it occurs in three, is false. Now that's the problem. For by stipulation, there is nothing in three to, indu to induce the name to shift to a non-customary mode. On the contrary, it's been stipulated, in fact, that in three, the name remains in its customary mode, wherein it designates nothing at all. The stipulated verb, schmexist, is false of Napoleon and Russell. It's not false of the designatum of the occurrence in three of the name Lou, because there is no such designatum for it to be false of. For this very reason, it's far from clear that sentence three is genuinely false. It is by stipulation a monadic atomic predicate, predication in which the occurrence of the subject term designates nothing whatsoever. It's therefore most plausibly regarded as not expressing any proposition, and, or at least not any proposition that's either true or false. The feature of three that's most significant philosophically is that as far as can be determined, in all relevant respects, it's a replica of sentence two. Both two and three, three is just a replica of two, both of them seem false. Yet it's known by stipulation that three, which is a replica of two, expresses no content that can be either true or false. The correct conclusion to draw from this is that despite appearances, there are no genuinely persuasive grounds for making <coughs> sentence two false in English. It might well instead be neither true nor false. In Kripke's terminology, the existence of the problems with two, that is the fact that two feels false, not only despite but in virtue of the fact that the name Lou does not designate, and the existence of cognate problems like that of seemingly true singular negative existentials. These problems do not refute the hypothesis that if the verb exists straightforwardly stands for a particular property of individuals. On the contrary, the mere possibility of three is in itself very strong evidence that sentence two is not in fact false in its, and it, that its standard negation is not in fact true. The overwhelming preponderance of evidence, in fact, is that sentence two and its negation are both of them neither true nor false. The correct conclusion is that it's dubious whether there exist false instances of sentence zero wherein the subject term alpha does not designate anything whatsoever. 
This result is in perfect accord with the existence of predicate theory. Now, it's tempting to reply that even if sentence two is not false, still sentences like Harry Potter exists, and even Harry Potter exists, are surely false. For Harry Potter is a wholly fictional character, and to say this is simply to say that Harry Potter does not exist. The response is erroneous. As I've argued in previous work, Harry Potter, since he's wholly fictional, is not a real person, let alone a real wizard, but the fictional character of Harry Potter is a real thing. It does exist. And in fact, it makes a lot of money for its author, J.K. Rowling. Uh, okay. All right, so just uh, one brief more point. Uh, there's a potential asymmetry, asymmetry between one and two. Between sentence one and sentence two. Sentence one, by observation, invokes a definite description in grammatical subject position. Sentence two, by stipulation, invokes a singular term, the name blue. The definite description is what's called an improper definite description. That is, there is not exactly one present in France. As a consequence of this, the term lu does not designate. Now, if with Frege and contrary to Russell, definite descriptions are cataloged as singular terms, the two sentences are extensionally on a par. In this case, sentence one is no more false than sentence two. On the other hand, if with Russell and contrary to Frege, definite descriptions are instead deemed quantificational constructions of a certain kind, sentence one may be genuinely false, precisely as Russell held, while sentence two is not. Against this option, it should be acknowledged that the negation of one, which is one prime, the present king of France does not exist, is at best somewhat odd. Much more natural is the sentence, there is no king of France at present or even any of the paraphrases that Russell gives for uh, sentence one prime. <clears throat> there is a remaining difficulty for the existence of predicate theory, and here it is. We understand sentence one and sentence two, and we are strongly inclined to deem both of them false on the ground that there is at present no king of France. If one is instead not false, and exactly on that very ground, and if for the same reason sentence two expresses no contents that can be either true or false, then what is the source of the strong temptation to deem these sentences false? It can't be that we don't understand them. We do understand these sentences. We deem them false. The issue is complex. One immediate reason for our inclinations is that most of us, and this even includes many philosophers of language, do not routinely distinguish sharply between a sentence being false and its being merely not true. Once the distinction between being false and being not true is posed, confidence that these sentences are not merely untrue but are altogether false is shaken. But the verdict of falsity might still persist, if somewhat less robustly, even in the face of the distinction. Why is that? I submit that a judgment of falsity is typically grounded in an intuition of the truth of the negation. That is, we infer that a sentence phi is not merely not true, but altogether false, from a prior judgment that not phi is assertable and therefore true. In the cases at hand, we deem sentences one and two false, not merely untrue, but false, on the basis of an intuition that with France no longer a <coughs> monarchy, the, ne the negative existentials, one prime, the present king of France does not exist, and two prime, Lou does not exist, are both assertable and therefore true. The inference in this case is hasty and almost certainly unjustified. Again, this might be established through Kripke's stipulated language strategy. The Schmenglish negative existential, three prime, Lou does not exist, feels every bit as assertable as does two prime and vice versa. But it's been stipulated that three does not express anything that can be either true or false. How then can three prime be true? And if it's not true, why does three prime feel correct? For that matter, why do one prime and two prime feel correct? 
insofar as one prime, two prime, and three prime are true, the, the word not, which is occurring in them, is almost certainly not a term for uh, exclusion negation, but it's instead a term for choice negation. Let me explain that distinction between choice negation and exclusion negation. Um, uh, choice negation, uh, when you negate a sentence that's neither true nor false, with choice negation, the result is also neither true nor false. But when you negate a sentence that's neither true nor false with exclusion negation, that result is true. So exclusion, uh, sorry, exclusion negation is an intentional form of negation. You have to truth when appropriately attached to any sentence that's not true, even if it's not false. Now, this is the form of negation that's more fully expressed by the classical logician's phrase, it is not the case that. It is not the case that it really expresses exclusion negation, as opposed to the word not, which probably expresses choice negation. There is no present king of France. Consequently, it's not the case that the present king of France exists, and it's equally not the case that Lou exists. We should hesitate to express these facts by uttering one prime or two prime themselves, precisely because the negation therein may legitimately be read instead in the sense of choice negation, which yields the truth only when appropriately attached to a false sentence. Reading the word not as expressing choice negation likely renders one prime and two prime neither true nor false, for the very ordinary reason that the terms occurring in the grammatical subject position lack a designata. I'm going to stop right here. Thank you very much. Guido, você está aí? Será que você podia coordenar? Eu estou cuidando da câmera. As perguntas. I have a. I have a small question about uh, Church's uh, Christian argument, as you said, against the general, uh, how do you call it, going up? Semantic assent. Semantic assent. Semantic assent. Why, why, um, why couldn't, like, like, thinking about identity, why couldn't